Hello and welcome to Restoring the Soul, a podcast dedicated to helping you close the gap between what you believe and what you actually experience. I'm your producer, Brian Beatty. Thanks so much for listening. Hey, this is a very special episode of the podcast as we're celebrating number 200. On behalf of the entire Restoring the Soul team, I extend a hearty thank you for supporting us over the past five years. Truly a labor of love for all of us. So keep listening and be sure to spread the word about Restoring the Soul. Now, In this edition, Michael welcomes back our good friend, Andy Kolber, to conclude their two-part discussion about Andy's book, Try Softer, and the resources that are now available, including the Try Softer Guided Journey, A Soulful Companion to Healing. Now, in just a moment, Andy and Michael will be discussing what it means to discover self-compassion. Now, many of us may not realize that just as God is profoundly kind and compassionate to us, we're invited to steward that compassion towards ourselves, too, in the form of self-compassion. Now, how do we do this? We begin by practicing gentleness and attentiveness towards our wounds in the same way that God is already kind to us. If you're not familiar with Andy, she's a licensed professional counselor, writer, and speaker from Castle Rock, Colorado, specializes in trauma and body-centered therapies. As a survivor of trauma herself, Andy brings what she has learned around the work of change, the power of redemption, and the beauty of experiencing God in our pain. So without any further delay, here's your host, Michael John Cusick. Andy Kolber, welcome back for another conversation. This will be uh, part two of our previous conversation. It's so nice to be talking with you again. It is great to be here with you. We were talking about your book, Try Softer, and what a success that's been, and how it is helping so many people around uh, the country and the world. Um, I mentioned this in the last podcast, but at Restoring the Soul, when people come for intensives, we keep a case of these books, Try Softer, here, and we give it out wherever and uh, whenever it's appropriate. But you have a brand new book out that is the companion to the workbook to Try Softer. It's called The Try Softer Guided Journey, A Soulful Companion to Healing. And then your name is beautifully written across. <laughs> it's just a good-looking book, as was mm. as was Try Softer. Um, so congratulations on the workbook and all the success once again. Oh, well, thank you so much. And again, thank you so much for your support. Um, here's a big question, and then I kind of want to go all over the map with different themes that you regularly teach about and that you do in your work. We talked about self-compassion, kindness, tenderness to oneself. And for our Christian listeners, let me throw in a Bible verse. Um, I actually think that for most people that come to counseling, it's the hardest verse in the Bible to obey or to align with. And it's in Colossians 3, verse 12. And it says, Therefore, you who are holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, Mm -hmm. humility, kindness, gentleness, and patience, and over all of these put on love. So if I told somebody, you, therefore, as God's child, uh, go do 100 push-ups and run a marathon barefoot on sharp rocks, and then uh, climb a tree uh, with no hands, you know, they'd go, okay, if that's what it says. And yet it's so difficult and I would argue impossible through effort to be compassionate and kind and gentle and patient to yourself. And yet this is really your life's work. Mm. And you mentioned in a previous podcast, this has been your journey as well as what you do. So here's the question. Drum roll, please. Why is it so difficult mm. for us to have compassion and kindness for ourselves? You know, I think that there's layers to it. Um, certainly, a lot of the folks that I work with have experienced trauma. And what I would start with is to say that those, especially when it's childhood trauma, and it's something that is a really young default um, stories and templates that you carry in your body, that 
I think for those of us who have those experiences, it's especially hard because often, you know, compassion requires a softening and to, to survive trauma, like a lot of times you basically can't be soft. You have to sacrifice being alive so you can survive. And I think to be truly alive requires a softening. And so partly, I think, to start there, the part of the reason why compassion and, and kindness and love is that, you know, especially like developmentally for, for like ki- for kiddos, um, it's really appropriate, not appropriate, but it's it's normal for kids to sort of blame themselves for their own experiences of trauma because um, kiddos are very egocentric and that that's appropriate. Right. And because they're egocentric, um, it becomes organized around like it must be my fault. Like the reason why I'm not taken care of by those who should lo- who love me the most in the world is because it must be me. The reason why the person who should love me the most in the world harms me, it must be me. The reason, you know, just fill in the blank, whatever that is, because that is really just where kids are at developmentally. I never made the connection with the egocentrism, which is not ego of Mm -hmm. inflation of self. It's, It's literally a cognitive ability or inability to see the other's perspective. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a, developmental it's, stage. Yeah. I, wow. I never made that connection. I've always known and said that children blame themselves, but that's why. It's mm-hmm. it's their frame of reference. It's that's all they right. have. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I think that's – I hope it's validating for folks who listen, who hear that, you know, because I think it can be frustrating as an adult. Um, you can even know it's not your fault and you will still feel like it's your fault. Right. And this again is the experiential piece, right? That there's a part there's of you that's holding that pain that has come to believe as a way to survive this time, this experience that that at least is the story that makes sense or it made sense at the time. Partly because that also allows you to stay connected to those who are providing, you know, your your home or your food or your whatever you those basic needs. And so our bodies are wise in that way. They're wise in the sense that they will do just about anything they can to survive. And thank God for that, you know? Um, but, but I think that is the first layer I'll start with, with that question is that when you've had those experiences, it makes it profoundly difficult. The earlier you learn something, the longer it's lived in your body, the more ingrained, the more you've traveled those, you know, that neural circuitry, um, that is deeply encoded into your body. And, and I think that's why for me, it gives me a lot of compassion for myself when I maybe I'm struggling with something around that, that this is like, this is an old, old, deeply encoded story, which is why I have to be profoundly gentle hmm. because it's, it's the opposite, right? It's, it's the repair. It is like if the rupture is continually feeling like you're always not enough, you're to blame, um, you're, you know, all, all the stories we tell ourselves, then how much more do we have to repair? For if the thousands and thousands of times that we told those stories, then it's like the thousands and thousands of little repairs. Right. And so from there, though, even for folks who maybe would say, well, yeah, I didn't experience that in childhood or, um, you know, maybe they had experiences of good enough parenting. Um, I think even then. This is not an easy concept. And I think partly it's because culturally, you know, especially in Western culture, we value meritocracy. (laughs) We value pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. We value a certain version of strength. We value, uh, frankly, we value white knuckling. Yeah. Get over it. Mm -hmm. Don't be such a baby. I mean, these are all really subtle that are part of our culture and they're really unproductive. Yes. So if you're if you're building um, a fence, you need to show up, dig the ditch, you know, work hard, maybe get calluses, sweat. If you are um, caring for a child, you're going to have sacrifices and you have to push through. But if that becomes the norm where you live and there's no grace, 
space, openness, softness to just letting yourself be, then that's going to lead to problems. Absolutely. I mean, I think part of why, you know, I think self-compassion maybe is getting a little bit more normalized, which I love, but I think a lot of people have this reaction to it. Like, ugh, oh my gosh, that's so whatever. That's weak. That's selfish. That's, and what's so fascinating to me, I love this. This is where I love to like geek out a little bit is that when you understand the nervous system, let's say you have a template where you've always been so hard on yourself and you just push through and you're just like, get over it, baby. Like whatever, you know, whatever that means. Part of what is happening there is that when we are having to armor up, we are inhibiting, like we're, well, we're not inhibiting, but we're like, we're not able to process and move through experiences in, in a way that's necessarily allowing um, emotions to fully process. So part of what's happening there is that if you experience something that's really disturbing, it's more likely to be traumatic. It's more likely to get stuck in your body because our body needs to have a certain level of sort of that softening to be able to move through something. Right. Alternately, let's say that's your template, but you begin to learn how to practice self-compassion. Part of what we're doing there, uh, Dr. Kristen Neff talks about this a, a lot. She's the foremost re researcher in the area of self-compassion. And she talks about how self-compassion taps into our mammalian caregiving system. Hmm. And what that's doing is like when you have a threat response in your body, which is what we have to sometimes do to overcome things that, you know, are really hard or big, um, we inhibit it starts to inhibit the cortisol response and the adrenaline. And so what that's saying is that it's it's sort of a form of co-regulating in your own body. Yeah. It, it dials down all of the things that make us ramp up, whether mm -hmm. it's an actual fight or flight response or kind of flexing our muscles and pushing in. Mm -hmm. It dials that down and then opens us up, as you said, softening to the opportunity for co-regulation, mm -hmm. to be cared for, to receive. Yes, yes. So Dr. Christine Neff. Dr. Kristen Neff. Kristen Neff. Yep. And and so this is this is a big deal because what this means is that's actually resilience. So what we're saying is is that self-compassion leads to resilience. Hmm. And resilience is big business in the corporate world and in athletics. So I think where you're going with this is that People who kind of poo-poo, to use my mom's word, uh, <laughs> compassion and say that's kind of weak, that it's actually contradictory to what they would want because it, it uh, makes you stronger, makes you more resilient. It would potentially heighten performance and the ability to be fully engaged. Yes? Yes, absolutely. And, and certainly, this is where I think sometimes people get confused, is that this is not saying that we don't need to do hard things sometimes. This is not saying that hard work is bad. This is none of those things. But it is saying, and this is where an awareness of our body really matters, is that if you're having to push yourself out of your window of tolerance into a fight or flight response or into dissociation in order to do something or if something is super painful and for you the only way to get through it is to disconnect from yourself, this is the invitation of self-compassion to turn towards that pain and, and to attend to it. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of layers there. And I think it's one of those things that um, we can explore for years that we keep learning. Back to Colossians three, because, you know, as we're talking about restoring the soul, I always like to bring in a theological biblical perspective um, that people might not have considered. So this idea of self-compassion, it's in like verses 12 through 14. And most people in their Bible, if you go to Colossians chapter 3, there's one of these man-made titles where they, they mm -hmm. broke it down. And it says, and I don't like the title, but it says rules for holy living in the NIV. And then it goes through, you know, mm -hmm. put off the old self, put on the new. And, and then it gets to verse 12. And one of the rules for holy living is... Be compassionate to yourself, gentle, kind. And it's as if it's like the it's like the bow on the first 11 verses that says, oh, by the way, you're not going to be able to do this mm. unless you have self-compassion. Otherwise, mm. you're going to feel pressure. 
you're going to turn in on yourself, as you said. You're going to beat yourself up. Everything that's the opposite of gentle, kind, and compassionate is where you're going to end up. And then who wants to, you know, live the Christian life or try to do what's right or be loving if you're in that space? So it, it really seems to me to be a key ingredient. So I don't believe this, but devil's advocate for a moment, and I'm curious if you hear this argument, um, you know, the idea of loving yourself is not biblical. Um, I, I've i been at a conference where I was talking about loving yourself, and somebody literally stood up in the back row, about 300 people there, and they said, that's not biblical, where do you see that in the Bible? And I think there's a lot of you know, verses that talk about it, and there's a lot of concepts, but it just seems to me anymore to be just a major theme. Mm. Like, would God say, hate yourself, um, or therefore, holy and dearly loved, um, beat the crap out of yourself. And don't be humble, but be proud. And instead of being gentle, be rough. And instead of being kind, um, really treat yourself the way that you would a really annoying next door neighbor who you mm-hmm. want to take revenge on. That's not the heart of God. And yet internally, we we theologically try to justify this idea. So first of all, mm-hmm. respond to the person that says it's not a, quote, biblical idea mm-hmm. uh, to mm-hmm. love yourself. Yeah. I mean, for me, the first thing that I think about is, frankly, love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> and so to me, I'm like, as yourself. So how do I love my, you want me to go like kick my neighbor's butt? Like what, like, <laughs> like you want me to go shame my neighbor? You want me to go, you know what I mean? Cause that's how I'm supposed like, cause that's, if that's how I am with myself, that's what you're, what, you know what I mean? That's what the expectation would be. And so I think that's like, to me, I think we so often, like we, we, people read that love your neighbor. That's beautiful. But there is a neurobiological reality in which when we are not connected to our own body. So if you're cognitively loving your neighbor, but you are disconnected from your body because you hate yourself, there will be very, very, very firm limits on how you can love your neighbor. Right. You might be able to go shovel their driveway or help Mm -hmm. a little old lady across the street, but your heart will not be able to lavish uh, goodness and blessing, especially if they're somehow irritating or unlovable. That's you right. can't, you simply can't sustain that, right? That's right. And I think there is a sense in which, you know, yes, you have to, you have to sit with that a little bit to be able to see that reality. But to me, you know, I think this is why it matters that we are available to truth that can come through things like research and science, because Without understanding, I mean, essentially, we don't have access to empathy. That's part of what we're saying. We both don't have access to empathy or compassion. So I just would challenge someone to go live the Christian faith without those, because I just don't see that being possible. Have you followed uh, some of the stuff on social media about the churches and a pastor in particular uh, who, who said empathy is a sin? And that it leads to inwardness. We won't go down that road, but um, I was recently speaking at the Apprentice Gathering, and Dr. Scott McKnight, foremost New Testament theologian in the U.S., um, read an article about that, and he just said, are you kidding me? I mean, where have we gone? I I know I'm kind of truncating the thought that you were on, but uh, because of limited time, as we're having this conversation, I'm thinking, where in society have we mm-hmm. seen this compassion? And I'm sure you followed Simone Biles, mm-hmm. the Olympic, you know, more successful than any other gymnast, and how recently um, it was in the Tokyo Olympics mm-hmm. where she chose not to uh, do her competition because there was a concern that she could be hurt because she wasn't at her best. And there was worldwide outrage. You know, maybe it was divided down the middle, maybe not. There are people like, oh, that's wonderful. But she did it because she's been in a very public journey of abuse recovery and trauma. And I thought, especially knowing that story, wow, how hard that would be knowing that to become, you know, a zillion gold medal winner, you don't try softer, you try harder. 
and you show up at four in the morning and whatever. And so with this trauma journey mm-hmm. of having been abused by Olympic, you know, a, a, official staff people and coaches and doctors to be at that point in front of the entire world with this expectation, what courage and integrity. And I think very few people have any sense of what would be required in that. But to me, this is an example of, I am going to love myself. Mm. My neck could snap. My career could end. Um, mm-hmm. And maybe selfishly, I don't think it's selfish. Like I'm not at my best and I can't perform for my team. Mm-hmm. Um, and I see versions of that happening again and again where women and men are going, nope, I'm not going to do that. Mm. And I think sometimes when there is a spiritually abusive organization or person and people go, you know, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to step away. It might not be initially against a resistance of evil or darkness. It might just be like, I don't deserve this. And it's a way of being compassionate. Mm-hmm. Setting those boundaries, it sounds like, is a big part of compassion. So I'll let you comment, but then talk a little bit about boundaries and how that's part of how we develop compassion for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just want to echo, I I just have profound respect for Simone Biles. I think for her as not only an abuse survivor, but a black woman in America to have the profound, I would, I would put that under the realm of fierce self-compassion. Um, and I'll, I'll just say Dr. Kristen Neff does a lot of work around that too. So I just want to give her props for that, uh, specific phrase, but it's this, willingness it's there's a um desire to care for oneself it's it's attending to oneself but the fierceness requires a mobilization whereas i think typically self compassion like a lot of the ways that i talk about it is is through the lens of tenderness and the and the other sort of balancing is the fierceness and i and i would say that um it's like i believe that healing requires both and I believe that's really the heart of God. I mean, so say that again. Healing requires fierceness and tenderness. I believe so. Okay, and I, I'll I'll talk about that with boundaries in a second because I think it's very interlinked. But I I believe it's also the heart of God. And you know, I, lately I've been thinking about this in in who Jesus was that he was both he both invited rest to those who were weary. But when there was injustice, when there was, uh, you know ways that people were being abused, there was a fierceness. Like this is like, this is like a no, thank you. (laughs) I'm not okay with that. Right. And that I think, you know, part of healing, and this is where I'll link it to boundaries is that boundaries, um, they create safety so we can be tender, but to have boundaries requires a mobilization of saying, no, you may not. No, thank, like, sorry, I'm not available. No, this is not okay with me. No, I will not be able to fulfill that. You know, and not that boundaries are always, like, we have to do this in every relationship. It's not all, it's not necessarily about a reaction to someone harming us, but for those of us who have experienced harm. Well, it's, it's about us harming ourselves by not saying or stating well, we learn to participate mm. in the harm. I believe that we have first been taught to harm ourselves, usually because I, I know that I can, I would say for many of my clients and for myself, there to speak up for yourself was, was not okay and perhaps dangerous. So you learn that, right? So that's the, that's the template you carry in your body. So you become an adult and if that's the template, then you continue to operate in it and you participate in your own harm. Wow. And so healing requires a reclaiming. Like this is the body that God has given me. These are the limits. This is my finiteness. These are the gifts. These are the relationships. And I can protect those. And that is fierce. To say it requires, whereas tenderness requires a softening, I would say fierceness requires a rising up. And, and not from a place of, you know, 
hopefully not from a place where we're having to go outside of our window of tolerance. Although I know for some folks, especially when you're learning boundaries, that can be very tricky and triggering at times. So I think there's lots of grace for that journey. But there is a sense of having to inhabit your strength. Well, even as you're talking, I'm seeing that you're inhaling when you said to expand. And then you exhaled when you talked about uh, the the tenderness. Um, so the tenderness and the fierceness, the fierceness isn't an egocentric, I'm going to get you, but inhabiting ourself where we expand into who we really are. And the tenderness is softening and releasing into who we really are. But both sides of it are part of our, our true self. I believe so. And I, I think that's so beautiful. You know, and I think it's just one of the things I've been meditating on lately is just that God made us to inhabit the fullness of our humanity. Like Jesus came fully human. That is, that blows my mind all the time. Just how human, I mean, yes, God, divine and fully human. Do you, do you realize, and I know you do because you went to seminary and you, you've, spoken and and worked deeply and for a long time with people. But for Christians, how um, foreign that idea might sound, that we are, that that Jesus came to make us fully human. Because so often the message is we're to be less human, that we need to dial down our humanity, our desire, our neediness, our dependency, and yet it's exactly the opposite. Mm. And in that that, um, expansion of our need and our our dependency and interdependency, we, we actually become who we're meant to be, and we become like God. Mm-hmm. I like to mess with the question, is God needy? Mm. You know, I think this is literally me just riffing on this. I have no, I, you know, I think I, I may feel differently in an hour, but when I think about that concept, I don't think God's needy in the way that we think of needy. I don't think it comes from a place of lack. Right. But God is, I think, maybe, I'm trying to think of a different way that we think of needy when it's not the lack. Like, I think God is tender in the tenderest way that needy could present itself. God wants to be with us in the way that a neediness could be present itself. God has, like, I think God inhabits those very human characteristics but I think God is fullness. And so whereas our neediness might come from, it's like a signal of maybe where we have not enough. Yeah. So I'm riffing too. Uh, (laughs) I frequently quote uh, St. Teresa of Lisieux who said that our poverty is our capacity for God, our emotional, relational, Mm. spiritual poverty, not per se monetary. And so, Our neediness is poverty, and God, because there's no lack or scarcity, he is wealth, and Mm. his need is to spread the wealth, Mm. and that he can't not do that. There's a Mm -hmm. compulsion to spread the wealth, to give himself away, to attune, to be the secure place. Um, As we're having this whole conversation, and your book is built in many ways upon this assumption, it all assumes that there is such a thing as love, mm. that there is a, a a place, a person, whether that's a parent to an infant, uh, a parent to a teenager, partners, spouses, where we look one another in the eye, we, we look to their heart, to their being, and it's transformational. It does mm. something to our neurobiology. And I'm struck by how in Jesus' very last sermon uh, on the night that he was betrayed, he said, all the stuff I've been teaching for three years, here's the summary. Here's here's what it's all about. Okay, listen up. I'm the vine. Mm-hmm. You're the branches. Remain. Hmm. Stay. Abide. Be with. Your word, inhabit. Hmm. And that is like par excellence, the metaphor for attachment, mm-hmm. right? That Yes. Everything neurobiologically in utero to death is like a branch and a vine. And to the degree that we somehow are severed or that that's connect- disconnected or perceived to be disconnected, there's death. Mm. And this is 
not a small point. You should come back and we'll talk about this. But <laughs> you know how what Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. Hmm. And I don't know how many times you've heard, well, that's God's punishment for sin. And my pastor at a very conservative church got up once and he said, God is not punishing you and God does not punish you. And I literally went, I'm going to join this church. Hmm. And I did. But um, the wages of sin is death because the branch and the vine somehow get severed and the branch can't live in the same way that if I cut off uh, a limb on my tree. It's like pulling the plug of a ventilator in ICU. Death will ensue. It's -hmm. not punishment. It's just what happens Mm -hmm. when you're dependent upon that. And I say all that to say, and I want you to have the last word, but... um, I see all that to say that love has us, which is a phrase that I use, that uh, that God didn't just give us an idea of love, but that he gave us a person, and he became a person, and he entered into the messiness, and back to your initial point, the realness of our story, and showed us that love is trustworthy, love is dependable, that we're attuned to, and that ultimately we are safe and secure in love. Mm, yeah. Well, I, I think that's just, it's beautiful. And I think for me, what faith has really, what my faith has really become it is mostly just this idea of it's an, it is an attachment. I mean, it is the experience. It is the actual embodied being with. And I can't imagine it not being that way anymore. Um, I don't really want anything different. Hmm. And, and I think, you know, I love, I love that phrase. Love has us because I really believe um, that's God's heart and desire that there is a sense in which even when we can't hold on, love holds us. And so I think there's such this beauty that, you know, I think of, you know, the verse where God is working all things to good. And that, you know, has been used so many times to to spiritually bypass for people and put bows on things. But if we can honor the reality of, of life and how hard it is, but hold the tension of the hope that God is working it to good, like that's when you say love has us, that's what it reminds me of. You have been listening to uh, part two of a conversation with my friend and colleague and one of my favorite people and author of the book, Try Softer. If you have not read or gotten a copy of Try Softer, please, 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 if you care about change, healing, transformation, restoration, becoming yourself, uh, this is a book that is a must read. It's, It's really a book, although this word is not Uh, in the book, to my knowledge, it's a book about discipleship. It's a book about what it means to follow Jesus into becoming the you that you were created to be. And Andy has a new workbook called The Trisofter Guided Journey, A Soulful Companion to Healing. And all of these are from Tyndale. You can find them on Amazon or other fine bookstores. But please make sure to check it out. And uh, we're so grateful for Andy coming by the studio. So we've wrapped up another episode of Restoring the Soul. We want you to know that Restoring the Soul is so much more than a podcast. In fact, the heart of what we have done for nearly 20 years is intensive counseling. When you can't wait months or years to get out of the rut you're in, our intensive counseling programs in Colorado allow you to experience deep change in half-day blocks over two weeks. To learn more, visit RestoringTheSoul.com. That's RestoringTheSoul.com.